Good afternoon, and welcome to a world where justice is gated off from men who sleep at gates, and people tell lies, contradictions, and halves truths. We're stranded in Franz Kafka's The Trial. Please, join us on Behind the Curve. That was a bit, way better way to say cool by listening to this and staying inside than anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I hear you. Stay, staying inside. It, it is the hottest day of the year so far. So, uh... Oof! <laughs> it is nasty outside. Uh, how are things over on your end of the world? Um, still as hot as where they are yours. And, uh, I don't live in Miami, for the record. <laughs> Yes, no, we, uh, I mean, for the, for ends of the world, we mean about 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, so, Franz Kafka's The Trial, or at least the, uh, Orson Welles adaptation thereof, uh, is the topic that we are exploring, uh, today. It's, uh, it's, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a, it's a dreamlike tale of bureaucratic horror. Is it in the genre now, bureaucratic horror? Uh, it's not like Brazil, if that's what you want to make people to think. I mean, they probably remember that episode a couple of while back. It's not tremendously, it's not unlike Brazil, though. Oh, no. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's kind of similar. It, it's, it's, um, when I say dystopian, it's dystopian in the old sense of the word dystopian, when dystopian was actually scary. It made sense. Versus, like, modern, like, Hunger Games dystopia. Yeah, not, like, post-apocalyptic. Ours, yeah, we kind of slur the word of post-apocalyptic, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's very interesting. We had the experience to, um, watch the movie, and, uh, I know we have some stuff to talk about. So, uh, Matthew, why don't you take it from here, and, uh, we can work from there. Well, um, I think we'll run down the plot here. Um, you know, the plot, for anyone who knows the novel, it follows it rather closely, and um, I really haven't read it. I'm kind of listening to it. I don't know if I'll stick with it. I probably was doing it for the podcast, but it's kind of about a uh, man fighting a highly bureaucratic world, like you said. He gets accused of something. He never finds out what it is, and then he kind of goes through like a, for lack of a better word, rigmarole of here or there, and... It's not really about like him, his actual trial. It's about like what happens before and after. Mostly, his most direct time. Uh, I'll 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 go along with it. Yeah, no, I, I'd say um, that. Yeah, it is a bureaucratic car. He doesn't know what he's accused of. The, there is a court system, but uh, as we see, their law books are porn magazines. <laughs> um. Which is in the book, interestingly enough. It is, and the one thing that I did appreciate, because I also listened to some of the book for the podcast to get ready, and I was surprised how much of the dialogue was dropped right in from the book into the movie. Like, there was so much dialogue that was just straight from the book. Like, word for word. And that is one of the confidence I had that this was such a controlled film, which mm -hmm. I have some interesting notes on. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear that because you are you are certainly more the film buff than I am. Yeah, I did discover this by the way, which is um, less bragging, more of a testament of how much bad stuff I had to get to, or subpar stuff to get to this one actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's actually one of the few times that Orson Welles got his vision made. If you don't know, he's kind of a high, he's been a Hollywood pariah since Citizen Kane. Well, when he was alive, anyway. Um, he kind of, uh, Assistant Kane was uh, seen as an attack against this guy, William Randolph Hearst, and because of that, he got a big sponge of Hollywood. But this film came from, I think, a Swiss or French director, and he gave basically um, Orson Welles, like, the most uh, creative control since Assistant Kane, and basically was the only after in his entire life, basically. So he wrote, directed, edited, and started in the film himself. And um, the previous show I wrote down, Alexander Salkind, um, mm -hmm. he basically, I think that with that in mind, that we can interpret the film with, like, total intent that you would have at the level of a novel, if that makes any sense. Okay, so, so interpret it, then, yeah, no, I, I'd say that, the, that you could, based on the accuracy of it, you could certainly attempt to interpret the novel through the vision that was presented in the 
movie. Um, I know this is a tiny bit off topic, but it just popped into my head. Is um, we talk about the vision of it, the the sets, the sets in that movie are masterful. Oh yeah. The sets and the lighting, like I don't think I've seen a black and white movie that well oh, set yeah. and lit. Uh, Even with, more than uh, Night of the Hunter. That's what I was gonna say. I'm not sure if more than Night of the Hunter, because Night of the Hunter was incredible and it did more with less oh, yeah. but it's up there it really is up there i mean the the, the lighting is just it's powerful uh yeah it is it really it, you know just it was one of those things that you could automatically tell even if you don't know the whole history of the movie that it was a it is an art it it, it was a director's vision it wasn't just thrown up there I mean, yeah, but, um, I don't know if you watched this in Kane, but that's kind of, um, Wells' style is like the, the neo and noir, uh, in a lot of ways. He did perfect that in his, as soon as his first film, if you look at that. I, uh, I have not seen Citizen Kane, uh, I regret to inform you. I've wanted okay. to for quite some time. You know, if you want to watch it with me, that's fine, but, uh, fine. at least you don't have to watch it, but, yeah, at least you know, you know of it. I mean, it is the greatest movie ever made, so... I should probably get on that. The well, funny thing that um, Orson Welles actually considered that th this his best film, which is another. Thing. I know that that is very interesting because most people, I'd say, maybe not most people, but many film critics consider Citizen Kane the best movie ever made. Uh, but it's interesting that Wells thought that uh, the trial was his greatest. I mean, he said that if you look at like his life or all his interviews, he goes like. He was on a Dick Corbett show in 1970. He said his next one was going to be his best one. I don't know if he meant Don Quixote or Other Side of the Wind, which are both been completed, and I don't think are as good. It is something he said frequently, but yeah, I think I think you're right. I think he was right when he first first came out. Like this was his best film. I would also throw out there a lot of artists thought their best work was often not their most popular work or their most yes. well regarded work. That seems to be a very common theme among artists. Another theme I, I see is like always being dissatisfied. Like the best people aren't the people who are satisfied. Like, and, and you think Orson Welles, you read about him, he's like pretty egotistical in his interviews. He doesn't seem to be. Like Shane Carruth, going back to Kramer, like he said, all he sees is rough edges. Now he didn't say he did, was disappointed out of it. He just didn't want. I just he was disappointed in aspects of it, which I feel is very amazing because I can never make that. And then. I think what Orson Welles said was, like, um, he never watches any film that he makes because he, he would embarrass himself. I mean, when he acts and stuff, he watches that, but not from directs and writes. Yeah, it's, uh... I can understand that from an artist's perspective, is, yes, the, the, great, the greatest drive is to say... You, part of why you're so driven is you want to make something amazing, but you'll never feel like it's quite good enough. Um... Doesn't mean you're George Lucas, but does it, but it means that you're constantly improving, and I think that actually yeah. is the best the best mind frame, mindset to be in. Actually. It it is, it, but it can also eat you up. It can it can also very much eat you up. Um. Yeah. Uh. So to to to, to change gears a little bit. Um, Let's talk about the story itself. Let's, let's let's talk about this 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 world here that we see. Let's uh, let's see Kafka's dream, and, and and here's the thing. So I I'm interested in this because it, it is very dreamlike. Yeah. It's it's intensely surreal. It uses moon logic. At times, I mean, there are active contradictions. Uh, I was just gonna throw out there sort of uh, there are there's a lot of symbology. That happens. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of symbology. There's some use of universal symbology, sort of Jungian, like universal, you know, cultural, racial mythos. Oh yeah, I like to comment on that. Like, I don't think it's merely uh, what I'm going to say. A lot of people see uh, Jewish themes in this as well really? as um, Freudian things. Like, uh, from what I understand, um, uh. Face. Franz Kafka, he's a big believer in Fordism, mm -hmm. and I think that's funny because by the time um, the sixties rolled around, it was uh, Fordism was more debunked as pseudoscience, and I'm glad that even though that was true, that Orson Welles preserved that vision, and I think you see that throughout the film. You do. You also see uh, another association with um, Freudianism is uh, 
there, there, there's a great preoccupation with sex in this movie. Yeah, which is, makes me glad that it was a French film because this would have never passed the American censors in, in the early early sixties. No, it, uh, it really would. I mean, it, it was never. I mean, it wasn't explicit or, or graphic no, it in any be, way. No, no, no. It would. It would be maybe probably PG thirteen today. I yeah. guess. Yeah. But like, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't like South Park. You know. Yeah. No. It was. Um, I don't want to say it's classy because it wasn't. But yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't insulting either. Yeah, it wasn't trashy either. It was. Yeah, it was. It, it was. I, th I think it was treated appropriately for the movie, for, for for the subject of the movie. It was. I think it was treated appropriately in relation to the story. Um, you think, by the way, that this is a bit of a war, what I call a Rorschach film. Like it's kind yeah. of certain aspects are made to, like not the thematic elements, but the characterization element. Like you can, whatever. Like just if you have a secret or you're a paranoid po person, you can relate to K. If that makes any sense. Yeah, Joseph K is very much a blank slate. Uh, and there are points when you feel sorry for him. There are also points when you kind of, uh, you know, he's also kind of a, a, a jerk. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph K is kind of a jerk. And actually, it's funny that um, Orson Welles said that he's actually kind of power hungry, that unlike uh, Sam Lurie from uh, Brazil, that he actually was trying to climb the ranks. Like, he's a power hungry individual. Like, he only cares for himself. I mean, really, he does. I mean, he he, I, I, he doesn't seem to care for any of the the like the women that he's with. When people come to help him, he he kind of uh, comes right back at him. When um, there's the um, the old man who lives under the stairs. You mean the guy who lives in the advocate's house? Yes, the guy who lives in the advocate's Block. house. Block. His name is Block. Block. Like the way they treat Block, like Joseph K does. It's just like, wow, this is a. Or even the way he talks about his landlady. Oh yeah. Like it, you know, it's pretty obvious that he is. You know, he's not a good person. Which is interesting. So I mean, maybe I'm wondering. Maybe this is maybe this part of the dream. Maybe it's part of the nightmare. Yeah, it's like a reflection of himself. Like I think I don't know if you caught this, but he says that um, even when he was a kid, that a teacher asked if someone did something, he always think it was his, even if. It was his fault, even if he knew that he, it wasn't him. The assumption of guilt that's that's associated with uh, different anxiety uh, disorders is sort of the overly guilt feelings. Makes sense too. Also, the panicky behavior, so, you know, the panicky behavior, paranoia. Oh, running around. Yeah, running around. Those those are all sort of anxiety disorder um, outworkings. Which is good for it, but I don't. But yeah, I think dying in the end doesn't really help things. Yeah, exploding. What a way to go, too. It's just like the whole end, the whole, like the whole movie leads up to the main character exploding in a hole. Yeah, I don't want to like get ahead of myself, but apparently Orson Welles made it change it from just having his throat slit like in the book to having sort of it be a last act of defiance. So interesting. So that'd be one part where he sort of deviated majorly from the book. Mm-hmm. Interesting. The nineteen eighty one interview goes over a lot of this stuff, especially with the people who come up to question him. Sure. Um, that's another thing that also like it kept contemporary for the time. Like there's a Cold War update, but there's not really supposed to be Cold War ish. Like it's not supposed to be a single country. And even Orson Welles said at the end that he trying to make the explosion at the end not look like a mushroom cloud to apply that. So it wasn't supposed to be like a nuke or anything. It's kind of funny. Like he says he actually hated his imagery, and I think I understand that because he, he'd rather have his his um characters explore theme rather than the uh so, the, the other elements, which is actually pretty un Terry Gilliam. I think it's interesting. It's an interesting approach. I don't know how I feel about it, but it's an interesting approach. I mean, like, I don't know if I would do it like that. I mean, like, I'm like, yeah, low budget, no budget. <laughs> I probably would, on. That's another thing. He actually had themes, uh, not themes. Well, yeah, he had that too, but he had, um, sets, uh, designed for the whole film. And he didn't, have, he didn't get to pitch them on time, so he actually just shot, like, in, you know, Parisian warehouses and Italian, like, cathedrals or whatever that was, you know? 
Interesting. So, so, so the sets were not completed in time for the movie. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I think just the big theme is just like um, exploring a society where justice is completely disregarded. Like, I think the most powerful scene in the film is where you see somebody's laundry being hung out in like a file room. Like, they had a camp out there in order to like to sort out something, but you never get to know what it is. And the people waiting in line who are like literally octogenarian or whatever like mm -hmm. that the world building touches that you get to get to see it for a moment like brazil i just think that that's epic yeah no it, it, it's it's very good i mean it's the seeing of wow this is uh this is a, this this is a thing that can happen when we put too much power in a system that nobody understands we 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 put we put the faith in bureaucracy and who's in charge? Nobody's in charge. And yet it exists. It, it moves on. Yeah, and yet it moves on. Functional, it, even for for reasons that go beyond the intent of why the society was created like that or how it came to be like that in the first place. It boggles the imagination, and I, I love how they showed the scale of it too. They repeatedly just zoom out and just show the scale of it. Oh yeah, it's all encompassing, you know. Like mm. you said, it was like a uh, modernist uh, meeting, like the architecture, modern version of hell by Kafka. Uh, you know, I, I'm not shocked. And there was one thing that actually made me think of that. It's like when they show the apartment block he lives in, and they zoom out. It's literally a bunch. It's literally like a city block in the middle of the wilderness. There's nothing you know, around. Like, who just came in when we were watching that part where the his landlady's dragging his um, lady friend's uh, suitcase? That was one of my favorite ones too. Yeah, like where they just like zoom out and it's just it's there's just a city block and nothing, and that made me think, oh maybe this is a vision. Maybe this is Kafka's vision of hell. Also, it's kind of like you know, it's like Brazil. Brazil mostly takes place like indoors. Like it's like this is entirely about humanity. You know, nature is. We're alienated against it or whatever, you know. We're not living as we should. It's it's artificial, but not in like an anti-consumerist way or even an anarchist way. Just as a comment on like the nature of bureaucracy. I think purely. Yeah. It's intriguing. I mean, I'm not saying I fully like understand all the themes being like shown here. This is my second viewing. I think you know that. I I'm not sure if I know that. Yes, you did tell me you watched it before. Yeah, so this is my second viewing, and um, I think that some things can only be understood multiple viewings. Like I didn't quite understand the priest scene at the end, except that like that was um, possibly society's way of corrupting him pay before he destroyed himself through religion, and you just reject that along with other things. But like, I don't know there's a lot going on here. It's like two hours of, of craziness. It's two. It is two hours of craziness. I mean, did, was there anything that you didn't, like, understand or, or, or didn't catch? Or, or... Um, I, 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 I will say that there were, there, were, there were parts where I was definitely confused. There was parts where I think I was trying to figure out what things meant rather than appreciate what they were doing. Oh, okay. I, I, th I think that's inherent to the movie, though. Like, I don't, I don't know how you'd be able to avoid that. Um, the ending was a little bit... The ending was, I guess I was a little bit surprised... But at the end, I mean, I find it very interesting that the advocate is such a huge part. Like he's like he's the way to get out, but he's also just there to bring you deeper. Oh yeah, through the story, that that's true too. I mean, like he kind of yeah, he was really interesting. Like he just got he actually Orson Welles didn't want to claim as the ego because the one guy turned down his role and he had no one else. How, who, do you know who turned down the role? Um. Yeah, I think it was a definitely American, but it was um, some some guy who was important at the time. Okay, that's that's fine. Um, it's funny because like um, the permanence of of this character is definitely throughout. Because I don't know if you remember like the scene with the artist that there's if you get past your first trial, then you kind of casually said, "Oh, well, I you, I can help you with your third trial," you know? Yeah, it's like it's like they just keep talking about, like. 
Well, there's no guarantee of a non-conviction, and it's like, there's no idea, it's like, it's a maze, it's an endless maze, it's a maze with no ending, that's designed not to have an ending. It's an impossible problem. Yeah, and then that's kind of, that's kind of shown to almost be like something that you rush to. Because it's like, it's better be, to be, it's another interesting theme that, um, I hate to say that in that society that Orson Welles' character is way the advocate, that sometimes it's better to be safe and not free than free and, and dead, I think is what he said. Sort of yeah. You know what this reminded me a lot of? It reminded me a lot of, I, I forget his name now, there's a, there's a Spanish writer, and he wrote some stories, like very intensely surrealist stories. Uh, Jorge? I mean, Jorge Borges? Yes, thank you. Uh, it, it, this, this almost reminded me of his, uh, The Library. The, the Library of Babel? Yes, The Library of Babel, thank you. Uh, I'm remembering everything for you. What? I'm remembering everything for you, but it's okay. Thank you. You are you're my thought caddy at the moment. Yeah, no, it is. So a lot of the interior landscapes reminded, uh, not the interior landscape, but the interior environment sort of reminded me of that. I mean, they're, they're impossible. They're impossibly big. Um, I think the part where that hit the most was uh, the... when they're all in the office. Or they're in Joseph K.'s office, which is, you know, this little pedestal out in the middle of this huge warehouse. With other people on their typewriters or whatever? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I remember It's that. a human warehouse. It's a thought warehouse. It's a word warehouse. I find that very interesting. Oh. Just to, I, just... I thought, like, the, the library babble was just, like, the idea of possibilities, like, that it doesn't just contain the books, every book ever written, but also, like, every combination of letters ever. I don't know. Yeah. But I guess that, that, that's it. It's, like, the infinity of it all. It's, like, getting things back to what you said. Yeah. So I have another interesting question sure. on this. That, um, psychoanalytic interpretation, like, you know that it probably it basically only works for fiction. So, do you think, yeah. since it's not what's merely going on, do you think that kind of interpretation might like, limit something instead of uh, giving or give it added weight? Like, how would it be a proper way of doing that before without it taking over? A... All right. So, if we add a psychoanalytic approach, we we would be looking for uh, elements of the subconscious. I, I think this is. A story that I don't know if it was written from the perspective of subconscious. I think it was supposed to be with an uh, intent to uh, mesh with that. I far understand that other uh, novels of Kafka try to go through that too. Yeah. It's not necessarily feel just like going on with the I mean, you, you, you could certainly have a interpretation where you're seeing where you see the advocate and the court. Uh, you can certainly see the advocate and possibly the court as, as a as the superego. Um, you could see the the various women who are, uh, I mean, frankly, uh, interchangeable. They really are, which is, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't necessarily think that benefits the story, but I, I think, at least in the story, the characters are very similar. They're interchangeable. I mean, they could certainly represent the id uh, and then you have the ego as Joseph K. And I think we see failed visions of the ego in Bloch. Because he is an ego that has been cowled by the superego represented by the advocate. Uh, and you also see in, um, uh, what's your name? Lenny? Uh, Lenny? Lenny? Lenny. It's Lenny. Yeah. I, I think in her you see, um, you see the id being cowled to serve, again, the superego, even in his interaction with it. It's able to arouse the superego, but it's not. A, but even it, it cannot overcome the superego. So it's a, it, it could be seen as a story about the subconscious dominance of the superego and the ego and the id fighting against it, but ultimately being powerless to do so. There's also, I also see, saw a theme about the Freudian slip. I mean, at the beginning where he's being, like, um, interrogated by the 
black cloaked men. Yes, the, bla the black cloaked men and the weird and the creepy guys from his firm. What the heck was with them? Oh, the people who were just staring at him in the other Yeah, place. they're just like smiling and waving and going through his stuff. To me that was like because uh, the rest are so common in that world, they just were taking advantage of it. Like how you hear about firefighters leaving people's houses during the fire. I don't know. I don't think I've heard of that. Where have I been? Um, they were just like the one guy in the back just like always like, Rubenstein! What was Rubenstein, right? He was the guy that kept touching stuff. Oh, no, I don't remember that guy. It was like, I don't know. Uh. Uh. So yeah, no, that, that's, that's an interesting road to go down if you're looking at it from the perspective of Freudianism. I don't think you need it, but I think it's interesting to know, like, that's how he thought it. Yeah. Spin on things. Yeah. Um, you know, it was updated for the Cold War. I also need to say, like, do you think that dates it? Or, or what? I don't, I think it kind of does. But at the same time, it is kind of timely. It's a very European film. Like, it is very European. Um, I'm interested in how you say, how, how you think it dates it. Um, Starters, that, it, like people who don't know the film properly and all its commentary you might think that the Cold War scene specifically like in a mushroom cloud and maybe just like have it to be less it's supposed to be a timeless story so if we see stuff in it like that we might think like oh this is just a outward for the Soviet Union or something I mean I I did not notice I mean other than the idea of an oppressive bureaucracy which is which is a, a, a you know a communist idea other than that, I did not see necessarily any Cold War imagery that I noticed right away. So, like, I mean, I don't... I saw the computer, that was very period. Uh, yes. The, is that in the original story? Because I, I did not no, get up not. to that it's, point. Yeah. Well said, it's okay. That did date it, but I think it... it yeah, that, that, that probably the lone dating thing, I'd say, that I had. It's like having cell phones in primary. Yeah, like the flip of cell phones and the chunky iPods. And... Yeah. But it's also too cool because it's not like something that's just there. It's just, it actually had like a main goal in the film, so maybe that's actually a stupid aspect. Yeah, it does actually matter. But I mean, then again, I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, then again, you know, not all. Not, not all you know, movies are going to be able to communicate purely orally or purely by, I don't know, like, letter. Like, a handwritten letter. Like, I mean, you know, if you, if you are making a movie set in a time, it's, you know, it's bound to have residue of that time. Unless you're trying to make it timeless, which I think it kind of, it didn't go fully into certain elements. Like, Brazil, I think, does this very well. And the fifth one, I think, does very well, too, is Children of Men. I mean, you've never seen that, so. I just think that you didn't try as much as you could with that. But other than that, it's kind of a thing. That, 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 that is pretty nitpicky, ultimately. Yeah. So, yeah. So, do you have anything else to comment on? Because I was going to Oh, you're just going to wrap up? Um, okay. Um, if you don't have anything else to say. I don't, I don't have a super ton else. My only other thing was that I, I was um, thinking about this a lot. Was... Um, I, I I was thinking about sort of the acting choice, and I thought that you know, um, I I wasn't sure if I liked how Anthony Perkins acted the main role really? until I listened to the book, and then and then I and then I was very sure that I thought he nailed it. Oh, why is that? Uh, just 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 the tone that the character has in the book, the uh, sort of the amount of sort of like uh, manic annoyance that he shows throughout. Sort of the sort of this uh, you know, this paranoid frustration. It's a, it's an odd. It's, it's emotion is sort of at a at a fever pitch, but it's not really any definable emotion. It's sort of uh, anger and panic simultaneously. Yeah, yes, it, it is in a way animalistic, but it's also balanced with some things that are like determined, quiet, stoic. Uh, fatalist almost so uh yeah it's and that's why and that's what leads me to the interpretation of the ego 
is the fact that the emotion is a blending of these things. This has everything to do with guilt. The whole story. To so, yes, to some extent it does have everything to do with guilt. Uh, do you have anything else? Well, I feel like this one is kind of a forgotten masterpiece. I feel like it's only not known because people are maybe not the smartest and they can't get a film like this or find it boring. Um, it also was almost a lost film for a very long time, and in fact, they probably people only know Citizen Kane, which was the most from Citizen Kane. Um, do you think that it is a masterpiece? Do you think that, like, other than things we talked about doesn't work? I mean, I don't know what your standards for fiction quite are at this point, so... Um, I do have a list. Okay. Um... It's certainly an excellent work. Um, the thing is, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, well, right. Already more unapproachable, which is something I don't like. Less things are unnecessarily confusing and already confusing. Right, uh, and so and so that's sort of my see for me. I want a master. For me, I think a true masterpiece needs to be approachable. But I'm not holding out and saying it's not. I'm not sure. I, I would have to take more time. I have to. I have to. You know. I, I would have to take more time to evaluate it because. You're a first time watcher too. Oh, I'm a first time watcher. My my main criticism, my really my only criticism is that it is highly unapproachable. Um. Otherwise, I think it's an it's it's an excellent work. It, it is an excellent work. I mean, there were definitely times I had no idea what was going on. Sometimes it would sort itself out. Sometimes it wouldn't. Uh, there are one or two elements, especially that there are parts of dialogue that I feel like, or dialogue or movement that I feel like would maybe work better in a book. Just one or two places. Um, and every once in a while, I might like a. There's one thing I would like a little more explanation of who characters are. Like that's something in the book that occurs. Like people like like the like you can say like oh this is the clerk, you know. It's like yeah, the clerk turns around. Movie, and you do that movie, you're like talking at the camera, which nobody likes. So. Yeah, and in the movie, you're just like, who the heck is this guy? Like 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 especially this thing like that bald guy who's like running along, like I'm going to help you, and he's like running along. It's like who. Yeah, it's like it's like who are you? The guy who like led him through the catwalks. Oh. Okay. Yeah, like 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 there were one or two other people who was like, or the exchange with the guy who carried off his wife or carried off his not wife. It's like. Oh yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah like that exchange makes more sense in the book. Oh, okay. It's like easier to follow. Yeah, and and I don't think movies should really come with homework. Unless yeah. they're like maybe unless they're made thematic, not so much. To me, it's like if you know that it works and you have trust from the director. Yeah. And you know that and it's interesting in and of itself. Like, I don't need to know, like, uh, space time relativity to, like, enjoy Interstellar, even though it would make my understanding of it better. Yeah. No, that, 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 that's fair. And, and that, that is probably my biggest and only real critiques of both this movie and Primer is holy cow, they needed homework. <laughs> um,. But so yeah, do you would you like to move on to our question and answer time? Well, one thing last time oh yeah, sure, is, absolutely. What is a film masterpiece to you? What is a Ooh. film masterpiece? Because I think the the audience ought to know what your standards are, hmm. or at least. Okay. All right, so a film masterpiece would be something that is. That well, is. And then you name a specific movie, or, or you. Oh, a film masterpiece, like, like a movie that I view as a film masterpiece. Yeah. Maybe you can think of. Ooh, um, I don't know. I've I've always been a, a tremendous fan of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I think it's a wonderful movie. I think that's a it's, it's well acted. It's well shot. Uh, there's some really excellent night shots of Washington. It's a uh, th 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 to me that's a movie that is both it's dramatic. It's dramatic. It, it gets the full sort of range of emotions. It arouses emotion in the viewers. It's accessible. Okay, that's fair. So, so I would say something that that the yeah, oh, um, arouses emotion. 
uh, it arouses emotion in the viewer, is a tech is of high technical excellence in all aspects. Uh, endures, uh, as in as in endures time, it endures both technically and emotionally. Not that it's really popular necessarily. Not that it's popular. It's just that it endures, um, as in that it. As in that its message is still relevant. Okay, it's, it, its message, its its emotional, its its um, excellence is still relevant. It's not like something that's like, oh, that was great in the '30s. It's not so great now. As in, it's it's still great. Um, uh, I guess I would say that, but the story itself is uh, the story itself is something that's worthy to be written. And, and and five is something. And five would be that I know this is a very subjective standard, but that it goes beyond entertainment. I think it's a, of a good crowning thing, and I think it's a good movie compared to because they're kind of both about bureaucracy. In a way. They are about bureaucracy. They they are both about about bureaucracy. As if one has Jimmy Stewart falling over with a waste paper basket at the end. Also, ten out of ten. Jimmy Stewart should be in every black and white movie. I didn't say that. Yes, I did. <laughs> Um, all right, so this brings us on to our question and answer section. Um, I have one that's pretty relevant. Okay. So if I can, if I can lead with that. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to do with the subject. Uh, just of uh, we're talking about just like fiction in general. Yeah, it, it does. It does have to do with uh, fiction in general. It and doesn't. Fandom, which is kind of what I'm getting into, but it's universal. Yeah. So, do stories need to make sense to be good? Um, you mean to the common person or, or at all? Because I. But let's a- let's answer both of those. Uh, let's answer both. So, to the common person or at all? Um, I can think of only a few films that didn't try to make sense. Like I'm thinking of the film that, believe it or not, Salvador Dali actually tried to make films, and they're purely psychoanalytical. Like an Andalusian dog was the example, and there was recently a, a cobbled together version of a product of the Disney, and it completely doesn't make sense on purpose. Um, I think you can make films like that. I've never really liked them all that much. To me, um, they've just been about showing off special effects and like being like kind of art in a European way. So I don't really know why anyone would make something like that anymore. You don't see a lot of films like that anymore. It's kind of funny because. Know, the economy has been better than ever, and going from night as as cheap as ever. So, maybe in a dream sequence is kind of like necessary when that, that's about it. So, yeah, it's not. A, I don't really like films like people think I like films like that. I think you know, some people call them off guard films, but I don't very much agree with them. Sure. No, I hear you on that one. And now we got, you know, absurdism from postmodernism. So yes, it's you do. Like the, the play where it's only 30 seconds and there's a bunch of trash and a woman screams and that's over. I can't stand absurdism. I, I, yeah, no. Absur- absurdism is something that kind of works in humor but not too much else. The only place you can really see absurdism occasionally is in like Coen Brothers who are pretty postmodern in a non yeah. way. Yeah. So, and that, I don't know, it's, I, I really don't care for those films anyway because of that so I can't really comment much about them. So you're not a fan of the Coen Brothers? Um, I, I, I feel like they're very hit or miss. Not not in quality, just in like what in me liking them. I want I wanna watch like old, No Country for Old Men and Buster Scruggs, but I just I don't really like I mean at least with the postmodernism and the Wachowskis I can kind of like try to like fight it in a way and deconstruct the deconstructionism and kind of see what they're saying and how especially for my new movie, how trying to explore how leftist think. You know, yeah. it is flexible that way. But it's just um Kind of ho hum, hopeless postmodernism of like Conan Brothers. It's not very exciting. I mean, it can be exciting, but it's, it's, like I said, it's nice. I hear you. All right. For you. Do you think there's a general wide lack of female writers in speculative fiction? How do you figure out whether this is true? And if so, how can we get them interested in speculative fiction? Interesting. Okay, so it's something that I've heard people talk about. Um, 
All right, so I'll, I'll say when I go to a new book sec when I go to new, when I go to a new books in a bookstore, um, science fiction, I see a lot of female writers among new books. Fantasy, still a pretty mixed bag. Um, I, I'd say probably more male still on the fantasy side. Um, I mean. Based on my personal experience, um, this is just purely based on my personal experience, so don't let this stand as a universal life. Based on my personal experience in writing workshops and writing groups, the female writers that I've encountered have been much more interested in general in writing realistic fiction. That That, 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 that is just what I've encountered, that's what I see you know, on bookstores, that's what I've encountered at writing conferences, that they tend to disproportionately go for realistic fiction. It's possible because in a biological uh, way that men tend to be interested in things and women tend to be interested in people, that you kind of get this, possibly? Or... I, I, I would not be able to back that up with any knowledge of mine. I'm just saying that's what I've experienced. I've experienced that... that um, Though I would say that a lot of dystopian fiction, a lot of more modern dystopian fiction in the sci-fi genre seems to be written uh, by, by women. Uh, YA fiction yeah. has, a, has a lot of female writers, has very successful female writers in it. Okay, so it's kind of more of a YA book disguised as fantasy. Well, it, it, is, it is. It's a YA book that's, it's a YA book wearing, wearing fantasy clothes. It's not a fantasy novel. Well, not really. um, Fun, but, you know. I mean, I... I will say people say, you know, fantasy is classically, you know, the white man's game, but Western literature used to be the white man's game. So I think it's unfair that fantasy gets picked on especially. Um, I know there's some people who have really picked on sci-fi lately, um, which interests me because I think, I think sci-fi is one of the fields where you can be most open, as, as in where literally anybody can be part of it. And I think that's because a lot of modern... A lot of old school sci-fi was very much sort of more inclusive of all different kinds of like utopian societies and futures and diverse crews jetting yeah, off yeah. to the corners of the universe. Yeah, I don't really know where they come from either. Like post Star Trek, Matrix, yeah. Like I don't know why people think that. Like it can possibly because like I think that's almost like how it's dominated now. I mean, like I'm sure there's inconsistencies everywhere, but like in the West, yeah, it's like kind of the opposite. But I, I, I would also throw out there, especially my experience with young writers, there aren't many people writing speculative fiction at all. Um, especially among younger writers. Potter's over, Game of Thrones is over, you know. It's, it's, it's not so... Now. We're not kind of popular, let's face it, anymore. What do you think it is? Well, no, because genres run on cycles. We've had yeah, we, 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 we have had the same genres for 300 years. I doubt we're going to lose any. I suspect we'll add a few, but I, we, we have we've never really lost any genres. Um, so they run in cycles. Like historical fiction was super big a few years ago. It hit a low water mark, and now it's on the way back up. Uh, a couple years ago, memoirs hit a high water mark, and now they're that they fell off hardcore. They fell off really hard, and I'm sure they're going to come back. You know, this is good. It, it, genres go through waves; they go up and down. Fantasy hit a high water mark in the '80s; it hit a low water mark in the '90s. I mean, it's it, it's it's just sort of the way it goes, and I, it go, it comes in waves. It goes in waves. I found very few people. I only really found one person in my undergraduate who was. Uh, I found two people. I found two people who were fantasy. Or, or fantasy or, or speculative fiction related, uh, but even they only wrote it very uh, occasionally. And were they female? They were, they were they were both female, but the majority of people that I I, I was in a class, I, I was in a writing class with um, one guy and seven girls, and and all the girls except one wrote realistic fiction. Interestingly enough, the guy wrote realistic fiction too, so it was. And uh, I talked to my professor later, and she said that, you know, the next time she did that class, she had, I think it was, I think the class was all girls that time, and none of them wrote, and only one, I think she said only one of them wrote one fantasy story, or specu speculative fiction story. 
So I don't know if it's just the fact that it's not the most popular genre or the fact that the books that we read in high school are generally going to be realistic fiction. Uh, I don't know if the fact that, that you know, sort of escapism is, is being heavily discouraged or the idea of uh, escapism or symbology is not necessarily encouraged. So based on my encounters, I would say that it's possible that men and women just have different interests, but I don't think that's the reason. I think, I mean, I guess it's possible. Anything's possible, really. But I, I, I just don't know. I really don't know. Based on my experience, it seems to me that uh, it's just not what the majority of people are interested in. Regardless, it's not what the majority of people are interested in. But there does seem to be some sort of demographic difference. And especially based on how, I think, especially how inclusive fantasy has become in the last decade, I'd say. Uh, you know, it's become, you know, intensely inclusive. Um, in the West, anyway. In yeah. the West, yes. I mean, uh, the, the fantasy has become one of the, you know, one of the tighter-knit literary communities become very, very open. Um... I think people are puzzled that it, it is it is because I think part of the reason that people are kind of talking about this a lot is because it's so open. Where why aren't why aren't we having more people that are coming? I mean, it, it could be a historical bias against past biases. It could just be that people that people want to write other things. Um, I mean, as much as I hate to say it, brutally honest, I I would just encourage to keep the genre open to different voices. I would definitely encourage that, but. I'm not sure pressing it and trying to force it to happen is going to be the answer. So my second uh, question for you, because it was a lot, um, having gone to Cooperstown, New York, which for everyone who doesn't know, is uh, the baseball hospital is located there. I've seen all the baseball stuff, including the museum. Do you now consider baseball as art? Baseball is art. Well, here's the interesting thing. I, I, uh... I made the argument that yes, uh, baseball is b baseball is an art. It is an art much more so than other sports, I believe, because it relies so. Uh, I think the only thing that you could maybe make an argument is like it in artisticness is golf, because in in golf, I think is about preciseness. Go golf is about precision, but here's the thing: baseball and golf are the two sports. Where being an athletic freak does not help you. It might, but it's not guaranteed to help you. I mean, being, you know, like, you know, being the size of Michael Jordan in the NBA is going to help you. You know, you know, it's like you're talking about, you know, like, I think he's like 6'7 is now small in the NBA. On average, I guess. Yeah. They have to take them under. Yeah, and I mean, you know, being giant in football helps you. You know, uh, soccer. You know, so soccer is a sport that you know, it's 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 very simple, and and athleticism is going to play right into it. But no, baseball and golf have this sort of special thing where they are desperately reliant on technique. They're desperately reliant on technique. They're most desperately reliant on art. But and I think baseball is greater than that because it also includes more athleticism. I think it has a far more storied and rich history. And I'm going to go with that. That's why I think that we, we need to... I know people are talking about you know ways to like optimize baseball, and that's a problem. Because when you talk about optimizing baseball, you start, you start to talk about optimizing an art. And how do you optimize an art? You can't really. You can improve things about it. I mean, like you can put air conditioning in your artist's studio. But, like... Not changing what they perform with. Right, it's like juicing the baseballs. The baseballs are juiced. Everybody knows the baseballs are juiced. It's not a secret anymore. And I wish, I wish the commissioner would stop lying about it. Speaking of which, just the new commissioner. You know, no, no offense to Rob Manfred. I'm sure he's a wonderful man. Uh, he's a terrible commissioner. He's he's an awful commissioner. Baseball has been screwed over twice back to back with Bud Selig, who forever sullied the league's reputation. And Rob Manfred, who wants to destroy the game to make it faster, he wants he, he he wants to optimize it, and he's going to kill the game. He's going to kill the game as a spectator sport. Baseball is not watched because it's fast. It's watched because it is slow. It is watched because it is artistic, because it is intricate, because it is beautiful, 
when we optimize base, when we talk about getting rid of, we talk about getting rid of, um, you know, umpires. We talk about getting rid of human umpires. We talk about, you know, uh, shortening games to seven innings. We talk about, you know, getting rid of the win statistic because it's not fair. I, I mean, you know, you know, why not? Why, why, why don't we just get rid of a, you know, why don't we, we can just, you know, throw out the whole statistic. Stop calling it the Cy Young. You know what? Because wins don't really matter. You know, wins are just, it's just luck. It's just what pitchers do. No, it, 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 it does matter. It, it, it does matter. We need to keep baseball weird. Sort of in this lifetime, we are going we're going to see the fight for the soul of baseball. We're going to see a fight to save the art of it. Because there are people out there, there are people with their with their calculators and their simulations, you know, sitting in their offices, you know, with their math degrees. And, and they're going to tell you, and they're looking at all the statistics, they're crunching all the numbers. But see, that's not baseball. That's not baseball any more than a stat block is Dungeons & Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is not a stat block. It's not numbers. The numbers, the numbers, the roles, the, the you know the difficulties, the difficulty um, challenge, the DCs, they are not reality. They are the facsimile of reality. They are the expressed facsimile of reality on paper. The story itself, the story that is expressed in Dungeons and Dragons, that is reality. The confrontation of nine of eighteen men on a baseball diamond, that is the reality. That that is the story. That is the mythic overarching story. And then and the statistics are merely a representation of that. And we grow so obsessed with these statistics that, that we are losing aspects that are dying out before our eyes, aspects that would make the game more valuable as an art, more valuable as a spectator sport. We have to save the weird in baseball. Just like we have to save the weird. We have to save the weird in fiction. Because it's getting... A... Oh, no. No, I, I, I don't disagree with using statistics. I don't disagree with, you know, making changes to better the game. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not upset that we change the disabled list to the injury, to the injured list. I, I'm not upset that we have domed stadiums. I, I'm not upset that we have a designated hitter. Uh, those are things that I think have made the game interesting. They've made the thing, they've, they made the game, I think, better. Um, I do like that one league uses a DH and one league lets the pitcher hit. I think you get the best of both worlds. That's the way it should be. I, I know that's kind of not a super popular opinion, but I like it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it being that way. Um, but yeah, I, I keep it weird. Like, it's like how cars have gotten less weird and have gotten less interesting. They all look the same. They all do about the same things. Because we've not only regulated it, and we've had made some good regulations, but people are afraid to be weird. People are afraid to be weird. Fiction is becoming more mainstream. Like, I walked through a classic bookstore. You know how many just mainstream blah mystery novels there are? Just, you know, there's they're, they're stack to stack, 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 stack of John Grisham. Stack, stack to Clive Kussler. Are they, like, older writers? No, they're, they're, they're modern, they're fairly modern writers. You know, and they're not... It's not that they're not bad books. It's that they're, 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 not, arti they're not artistic. They're not great books. They're not that anybody would describe as great. They're not... They're not weird. They're, 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 they're mainstream. We're losing weird. It's time to save weird. In baseball, in art, in literature, in transportation. Let's save the weird. Okay, sorry. That, that's, that's my rant. I'm, I'm, I'm good now. Uh, if you have anything else to add, we're approaching up on an hour, so I think I'm going to end this episode. All right, so uh, thank you for tuning in as we plumbed the depths of the trial, meandered through artistic talk about baseball and the genres of fiction. Have a fantastic day, America. Stay cool out there. It is gnarly. Bye now.